Hi everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel Software Testing. Still Daniel here and today you have seen it in the title. I have another interview partner. This time it's Mark Rinteringham. I bet many of you know him from his work and contribution to the testing community, not only for when he was working for the Ministry of Testing, but also the things that he has done so far for the community, writing blogs, going on conferences, organizing them, and lately he also released his second book, AI Assisted Software Testing. And I'm really happy that Mark took the time to talk to me and talk about all the things testing, what are his current challenges in his work, and of course, we're talking about his book. So enjoy the interview. Welcome, Mark. Welcome to my YouTube channel. It's good to have you here. Um, please introduce yourself to the audience for those of you who don't know you. Oh, yes, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Mark Winteringham. I am a senior quality engineer for John Lewis Partnership. Um, although people most know me from sort of my experiences and my work with Ministry of Testing. Um, I am also an author of uh, the book Testing Web APIs, and I have a new book coming out soon called AI Assisted Testing, uh, which is in Manning Early Access Publishing. So people can get early access copy right now and give me their thoughts and feedback on it. Um, yeah, that's kind of me at the moment as it stands. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I, I hope that the majority of people who are watching my channel uh, know you. I mean, as you just mentioned, I think the majority know you from all the work that you've done for Ministry of Testing, like working on the courses and organizing events. And I think that's that's really cool. And But it's good that you are like still around, you know, in the community. And I think we yeah. will see each other at conferences as well again. Perfect. Oh, brings me basically to the next question like what can you can you explain us a bit more about your, your new role what are you doing like what are your challenges in your latest uh, or in your current position it's funny you said that. i'm still sort of kind of figuring that out myself but um yeah i i think um so my role it's sort of kind of going into the challenges part thing of and mm -hmm. kind of why i've sort of moved back into this space is is that um I do see like the the world of testing has changed a lot. So mm -hmm. the fact is, I am a quality engineer. I've never been a quality engineer uh, in previous roles. You know, I've been a tester, I've been an automator, and I've done you know some aspects about sort of um, you know selling quality to a team, getting the team to buy into quality uh, in the past. But it's never been like my actual job role. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's. Um, a lot of it is about it's, it's less so focused on doing the testing, more about sort of promoting the testing within the team, mm -hmm. promoting that quality mindset. Um, and yeah, like looking at ways in which the team um, are, I wouldn't say necessarily struggling, but like basically looking for ways to sort of, you know, amplify the team's abilities um, around the sort of quality space. But yeah, it's it's very interesting. Um, I say it's it's kind of new. It's difficult sometimes. You feel yourself drifting back into the doing testing part, which is always uh, cool to do and always fun. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, yeah, it's um, kind of what I'm looking at at the moment is sort of just getting to grips with with being in that new space where it's more of like yeah, like more of a mentor, more of a coach to the mm -hmm. team. Um, nice. As you can tell, yeah, still figuring it out myself a little bit. Yeah, okay. but, yeah, excited. I mean. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, and it's also not an easy part, right? To to step back from the tradition, like okay, you're a tester or a test automator, and going and helping the team to establish a quality mindset, you know, to advocate for quality, and also explain sometimes developers, like, hey, it's a good idea to write tests or to to do some testing additionally on the the work that they have done, and any any tips and tricks that you that you're using, like to convince to convince people of investing more time into quality or so not so much on the convincing side, but I think more like on my side, like mm -hmm. uh, reflecting on my own uh, patterns, because I think you know I, a lot of the material that I see out there talking about quality um, uh, engineering, quality coaching is great. And it talks about that sort of like ways in which you're influencing the team. But I think also as well, you have to kind of sort of reflect on how you behave around the team. Um, mm -hmm. So like the urge to step in and do mm -hmm. things um, and, you know, like appreciating the fact that when you are teaching somebody something new, they are figuring it out themselves. Yeah. 
they're, they're not going to sort of um do it to the level that you're doing it same mm -hmm. reason for like if a developer was coaching me in developing stuff you know part of them would feel like oh just step aside i'll do it it's just easier <laughs> if i do it i know the shortcuts i know those sort of things and stuff oh yeah so, I... yeah fighting those sort of urges i think is is an important mm -hmm. aspect that's that's definitely like the big that's the big thing i'm keeping in my mind as i sort of mm -hmm. progress and sort of kind of grow in the role really is mm -hmm. yeah it's you've kind of got to let the other people have those opportunities and not take control no, oh, yeah, it's not easy. I I know it myself. You know, if if I have to look at my my people in the in the, the department that I'm heading, it's also like the people that are new to testing. It's like, okay, look here, look there. You can do this and that, and then it's like, okay, I can do it myself. But no, I I don't have to because it's or I cannot because otherwise I'm not helping them out. Right? It's 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 good to to set like like boundaries or like obstacles that they can reach with their current level and they have the the feeling of a success right so they they know okay oh i achieved something yeah. and that that's a, a really important yeah I yeah but... it's just dif difficult as a coach when you're in the uh in the when you're coaching in the domain that you're comfortable in mm -hmm. that's that's where it's more difficult whereas i imagine like coaches who are coaching people in areas that they don't know the domain it, it's probably a different dynamic yeah Absolutely. Yeah, that's not an easy one. Definitely not. Okay. Yeah, sounds sounds like a sounds like a good challenge, to be honest, right? I mean, it's not oh, like yeah. okay, fighting for quality or convincing management to invest in quality or do stuff. So I think that's that's a good thing. And and how, with how many uh, like you're now in this quality engineering position and role, like with how many people are you working in a team together? So is it like a typical agile team, like five to 10 people and they, you have always like, you work towards one goal and then it's sometimes easier to convince people to, you know, to, to focus on things together to, to make a product great. Or is it like a distributed environment? I don't know, with hundreds of developers. No, it's, it's, um, you know, it's a fairly, uh, sort of standard complement of agile people, mm -hmm. agile team, a little bit bigger than, than 10, but, um, yeah, sort of your usual sort of kind of core team um, okay. that's uh, focused on delivery. Um, you know, there is we are remote, so that does mm -hmm. make that interesting. That's uh, it's the first time I've, although I've worked from home for a long time, it's the first time I've worked on a team, a development team uh, from a remote sort of situation. So that's interesting in and of okay. itself. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's uh, I mean, like actually coming into the team, they're like they're a fantastic bunch uh doing really amazing things as well so it's sort of um having the opportunity to actually thinking about sort of you know what's the next level um you know what are ways yeah. in which to, to yeah. mm -hmm. interesting sounds really cool and you mentioned already into in the introduction uh like you wrote books and i mean i wrote books too and i know i like the the pain, the struggle, the workload that comes uh, along with writing books. And like, like, how did you become a book author? I mean, I have my own story. I mean, I think I shared it already a couple of times online, like how I became mm -hmm. a book author. But like, like, I'm always interested, like how, what, what was the initial like point in time that you said, okay, oh, now I write a book. Was there something, was there anything or? There was definitely like a, a catalyst. Like there was definitely a point in which it happened. Um, I was I was literally watching uh, a gaming stream um, and the guy who was gaming was also an author and someone asked him a question like how do you write a book and he went page a day and I don't know why but something in my brain went mm -hmm. oh okay I could do that like I'd do a page a day and 30 days later I'd done a chapter and I was like oh okay I see like if you work on this in small incremental pieces um then, you know, it, it is, you've got to play the long game, but, you know, after six to eight months, um, a year, you've got a whole book um, there. And I'd say though, like, you know, that was sort of kind of the impetus to write a book, but the material itself existed already in mm -hmm. uh, the training courses that I'd done in the past. Um, I'd done a lot of teaching around testing web APIs already. So I had a lot of domain knowledge already going in. So. I always almost feel like the first book was about learning how to write, how to write a book and how to go through that process. And I went through a publisher and learned all about that. This time round, it's interesting because I've come at it that, well, I know how to write a book now. I know the process. I know what to expect, but I don't know the subject matter that much. So I'm <laughs> learning more about how to like 
research new topics, mm-hmm. experiment with tools and things like that. Mm-hmm. And that's what made the second book quite uh, exciting and interesting in a way that was uh, it's different to the first one, which was exciting mm-hmm. and interesting. So, you yeah. Know, um, yeah. Yeah, it's literally one day I just went, okay, I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> did, 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 did you tell anyone that you did you start writing a book or just was it just no, the idea no, with... no. I, it's a few people had said like based on the training you should write a book and i'd actually mm-hmm. been quite resistant to it because i was a bit sort of like oh no i'm not i'm not a very good writer i don't you know i don't like how to do yeah you know, i don't know how to do that i don't know how to process i can't stick at it but then i realized like before that i was blogging quite a lot personally and through companies and stuff you know, I was accruing those skills there but I think mm-hmm. that was key I didn't tell anyone really about it other than close family uh until until like we got the first three or four chapters mm-hmm. released because I didn't want to be like to everyone hey I'm writing a book and if, like what book <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah 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 i can totally relate i mean i when i had the idea while writing my book is okay i just told my wife because i was also like really afraid of, of failing you know and mm-hmm. putting so much effort into it and also i can again totally relate i'm also not a, the the good writer and in the past also in school writing was never my passion so and yeah. for me it was also an experiment see if i can do it like if i have the 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 the, um, the long enough power to to really to do the research writing every day i also spent like every day I don't know if it was a page a day, but I like the idea of having one page a day. Uh, but usually I spend like my evenings, my nights over and to to research and to see like how, what can be in the book and stuff like that. But having like a course like you did or like you had before is really great. And that's cool. I mean, that's, but still, I mean, yeah. uh, for the audience, it's writing a book is exhausting. I mean, especially if you work with, um, it's it's not negative now. What I'm just saying is like working with a publisher is, is really good but it's so much work that you have to do like the copy editing yeah. the whole process of getting getting the, the the issues out like the typos and stuff and also like the the graphics and see that uh, you have the all the rights on the on the content and nothing is like copied somewhere i mean that's usually not the case if you write a book on your own but but still it's it's a long process right and um, yeah and they have a lot of insights that they can share with you yes. as well. So I, I had that choice. I was like, do I go self-publishing? Do I go mm-hmm. with, with publisher? And I chose to go down that route. Because also as well, you know, like having a contract um, and having deadlines set as well keeps you honest. Uh, um, yeah. And I kind of felt like I needed that as well. Mm-hmm. But there was there was a lot that I learned from the editors as well about how a book is structured mm-hmm. Um you know, that first chapter that I said I, I wrote, I handed it in and that got dropped. So that 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 30 days uh, was great. It gave me the courage to continue, yeah. but it never appeared in the book because <laughs> the material I was writing at that point, the editors were like, well, what's stopping someone from just going on the internet and finding that bit out? Yeah. I was like, yeah, oh, we, yeah, yeah, you're not, <laughs> you're right. Yeah. So um they help you to focus as well like Mm -hmm. on on the valuable bits the bits that you know are worth sharing that sort of like elevate it from just sort of you know a collection of blog posts or something yeah exactly it's also it feels more academic you know if you write a book and like setting the stage you know giving all the context uh, get some uh, additional resources and to really have this in mind that people would like to read it because they would like to learn something and as you just said the internet there are so many things that they can get for free but there's always like this depth you know it should be like something really good and special that people get the book right so yeah yeah I'm totally I, I see it as my the way i've been approaching these books is i see myself as almost like a curator mm-hmm. so it's it's not like i am necessarily sharing anything that's um new but what i'm good at is taking those sources yeah. and framing it in a way that makes sense for the reader. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's an important thing that I think some Absolutely. people don't realize they think they have to be new, they have to be novel, but actually there's, you know, being in a situation where you can kind of help um, demonstrate stuff in a nice, clear, concise manner mm-hmm. is just as valuable as the, yeah. as the new and shiny. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, this brings me basically to the next question. Also, you also you mentioned a bit already that like the second book that you just like wrote and it's like in the in the process of being released and you you can already get it, like the first chapters is the AI-assisted software testing. Um, like how, 
uh, how do you do the research? Because AI, I mean, AI is the biggest topic since last year or the years before already. LLMs and everything is in everybody's head and in newspapers, even in small local newspapers, my parents talking about it and stuff. So it's really crazy what's going on. And like, how did you start writing the book and the research around the topic? Because there's so many things out there. It's really hard to to digest and to find the right things that you put into the book. Well, you spend a lot of time refreshing Twitter, hoping that Open API, <laughs> Open AI, are not going to go uh, go down the swanee because all your prompts are written for ChatGPT. That's a good yeah. start. Um, it's it's a mixture of stuff. So this kind of harkens back to the automation and testing stuff that I've done in mm -hmm. the past, where I think there's it, it comes in two threads. So there's the sort of passive way, like so I've signed up to a bunch of newsletters. Mm -hmm. um, there's podcasts. Um, you know, I'm casually having conversations as they come, but then like when I'm thinking about like a specific thing, so for example, I'm working on the chapter for fine tuning at the moment. So a good example there is, is that two weeks ago, um, I, I, I was starting to form the ideas around fine tuning. I purposefully looked at some, uh, some courses. I'd looked at mm -hmm. some material and stuff and I reached a point where I was like, um, I think I get a sense of this, but how am I going to communicate this in the chapter? Mm -hmm. Then what I did is I actually took a few days off um, and then just put a, pod, a few podcasts on in the background. And then one of them uh, was talking about a tool called Axolotl, which is a tool mm -hmm. that can be used for fine tuning um, uh, AI. Um, and immediately it was just that mention of that tool. Man, I could go and look at that and it was the missing piece. Perfect. And I don't think I would have found that in my research because I was very much focused in a certain way. So it's a combination of the two things. There's, there's mm -hmm. yeah, research with intent. There's problems I want to solve. There's a lot of playing as well. So, you know, experimenting with prompts, um, setting up like um, these, these models on my laptop and, you know, basically leaving it to run for four hours while I go off and do something else. Um <laughs> you know it's it's as much I, I think it's important as well like the things that you're sharing in the book have to be things that you've experienced as well yeah. so I, I try and which is tricky because it's yeah. it's ai so it's always going to be slightly different yeah. but yeah i try and sort of experience them mm -hmm. uh from that perspective i make notes and then that becomes like the thing that is written Perfect. so it's different like last time it was a page a day whereas mm -hmm. this time mm -hmm. it tends to be my month is half research half frantically writing the chapter yeah. to get it in yeah, yeah that's a, but that's the, that's a good idea i think because as you just said like the the field of air is just every day is changing i mean also like uh, checking twitter x now and also like other sources it's like there's no day that without no new tool new update to llms and stuff so it's really crazy what's going on and i'm 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 really big fan of it sometimes i'm a bit afraid what what's going to happen and what might happen with AI, especially if people use it, using it the wrong way. Um, mm -hmm. But overall, I see it as something positive for us software testers, also for software developers that because it can bring our lives so much more joy, I would say, because it can take over like the, the boring stuff that we don't like to do and can also help us like right on the spot when we do some testing, some developing like GitHub Copilot, for example, and others. Mm -hmm. yeah. For yeah, for making for making our lives easier. And, and that's what I'm I'm really looking forward to. I agree as well. And, and and that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book is the same thing. I agree that I think that there's, there's a lot of potential benefit that mm -hmm. can be gained from these types of tools, but also, you know, we have to be massively skeptical of them yeah. as well at the same time. So, you know, it's, it's very much like rooted in, you know, I've tried to do that in the language of the book, you know, mm -hmm. I, I try not to anthropomorphize these tools. They don't mm -hmm. think uh, they're not a, a he or a she or a they, um, it is literally a bunch of weights and balances, uh, very sophisticated weights and balances. Mm -hmm. And that has uses in places um, where, you know, actions are explicit and context is clear. But mm -hmm. also as well, yeah, keeping that mindset of that these cannot solve every problem for you. Mm -hmm. um, they require a lot of thinking on your part first. You've got to do some work first to get something yeah. into these machines, yeah. to get something out, um, you know, okay. it, and I think that bit doesn't change, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. It's the same thing for AI as it is for any sort of type of tooling. Yeah. You're not yeah. thinking about what you're, you're not being intentional in your thinking beforehand. Mm -hmm. It's just all, that's when the wheels fall off. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, and and yeah. I mean, we're just at the beginning, right? I mean, I, who knows what's going to happen in one, two, three, four, five years with AI and what what more possibilities we might have with that. Right? So I'm really looking forward to it. And brings me basically also to my one of my next questions that I usually ask my, my people on the interviews, like where do you, where do you see like the, the future of software testing or software developing heading to? Is there anything that you see that will change or something that we should be afraid of or should be happy or uh, be happy waiting for it or, you know? So I, I struggle with this question sometimes uh, because I think that the what sits underneath that question is, is an assumption that we are all in the same part of the journey or in the same mm -hmm. sort of context. Like my work in Ministry of Testing and all the training I've done is, is that actually things are quite elastic like mm -hmm. there is a range of experiences you know some people are just starting their first ever agile transformation some others are you know turning large language models into oracles that can be used to uh, a system in their testing and there's uh, there's always sort of that kind of shift in there mm -hmm. um so uh, it's it's difficult to say that because you know if i'm speaking to a specific audience member like what their future what the future of testing for them or the future of quality for them is going, to be, is going to be very different to, to others. Um, and also as well, I'm, I'm always curious as to like, what, you know, I, I think there's a lot of value in actually looking at the past as well. So mm -hmm. like to, to flip it on its head, so to speak. So there's uh, going on a bit of a tangent, but stick with me. There's a guy on YouTube called Rick Beato Um very big name in sort of the kind of music YouTube channels and stuff, does lots of interviews. And he did a really interesting uh, video where he talked about how years and years and years of auto-tuning has basically um, trained us to accept AI-based music. So because we've, it's not been a case of all the things have changed at once. We've had a big leap in that sort of space, but this auto-tuning, this, this, uh, sort of softening of the edges mm -hmm. of music has happened for so long that when AI came out and started generating its own music, it just sounded sort of similar to other auto-tuned pop music. And I think that's what's really interesting with like testing is, is that I think a lot of the challenges that we face with, with AI, and I do see it becoming more prevalent um, in the future in our, in our testing, the challenges and the benefits are actually much more rooted in the past. So our mm -hmm. attitudes towards testing, our attitudes towards tooling and automation, that's what's going to inform our own experiences with using tools like AI. And also, you know, in terms of like going back to being a quality engineer versus being a tester. Um, so it's, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that really answered your question, but that's no, kind it's, of like it's, where my sort of head sits mm -hmm. with that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I like the, like the method, meta, metaphor of like this elastic, you know, bubble or like anything that can be around like because i think exactly what you just said i mean there's so many different companies out there and different industries that have different challenges and different steps to take to be in the future yeah you know whatever the future means yeah. for them and i like it i like to uh, i have to i have to more more think that way because i think that that's that's really really good thing because um that's exactly what we face and also when we talk to people on conferences or online it's like they all have their own challenges and their own like yeah things to tackle and to 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 work with right i mean for one it might be like be, becoming an, an, an agile tester like going into agile testing and others might i don't know still be at the forefront of things right yeah. yeah, and it's and it's why like things like conferences, you see the same talks happening again because mm -hmm. people are experiencing those things for the for the first time, and that's why like when some people are like, oh, I can't share what um, I've experienced because someone's who you're, somebody's already talked about it. It's like, yeah, yeah, but they spoke to a completely different audience, yeah, and their journey through it was completely different to yours. Yours is equally as valid as well. Um, so. That, yeah, that elasticity is not it's not a bad thing, you know. It's, no, no, it's a it's good not. thing, but it's, yeah, it's, a good yeah, thing. it's something to keep in mind. Yeah, but it's always something to to re to remember ourselves that this is mm. this is the, the the real world. Okay. Yes. Um. Yeah. Uh, one more question that I have is like always uh, also one question that you typically ask people in my interview rounds is like, what advice would you give like somebody who is going to start in software testing as a complete newbie rookie in the field? Ooh starting out 
Um, yeah, interesting. I, I sort of, part of me thinks is that have confidence in yourself and your abilities. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think a lot of a tester's value comes from their own, like, heuristic mental abilities. Um, you know, being able to understand the code and the tools mm -hmm. uh, helps enhance that stuff, but it really starts with you. I would say that's probably um, one of the big things. But then also as well as, you know, that idea of that testing is easy. Um, yes, but you try doing it with intention when you've got a deadline and budgets, um, it becomes a lot harder. So, you know, that's what, if you want to become a professional tester, like that's what distinguishes you is it's someone mm -hmm. that can look at a context and go, I know how to be effective in this context. Um rather than I know how to find bugs, I know how to mm -hmm. break things and stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, and like risk. That. Just always focus on risk because mm -hmm. that always gets forgotten in a lot of times. Well. <laughs> so true. Yeah, great, great answer. Thank you. Yeah, and cl closing the interview is like the, uh, one more last final question. Like where can the viewers get your latest book? Because I see on my channel that AI is a big topic. Uh, the videos get uh, views and views and views accounting and um I have read your book as well, as long as I can read it, because it's like chapter three or four out so far. So I'm still waiting for, for the next chapters to come out. So no no pressure yeah. here. But for the people who would like to get the book, where can they find it? So now it's this, this so, stage. <laughs> as it stands, well, you can always get it on manning.com um, and then just search for AI-assisted testing. Um, yeah, it's currently in early access. So we're releasing a chapter each month. So I'm actually pretty close to finishing it. I think I've got three chapters left to do, um, but we are releasing a chapter month by month. Um, but yeah, manning.com. If this is, you know, if you're watching this video sometime in the future, then it's also available on Amazon mm -hmm. and all good, all good bookshops and all nice. that sort of stuff as well. So, but anywhere where you get a book, uh, you can pick it up. But nice. uh, yeah, manning.com right now is the place to go. Right. Okay, perfect. Any other links that you would like to share me with uh, with us? I mean, we can put it down in the video description, but or I don't know any any website, any blog that you would like to to mention anywhere you blog, or is it something that you don't do at the moment because you're writing a book? <laughs> um, I am hoping to get back into it a little bit more, uh, back into blogging. That is, mm -hmm. um, because uh, I say like all that stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor from the old book i feel like i could release that and there's other mm -hmm. bits and pieces that i can share and uh, in the new role there's a lot to sort of kind of explore there as well so um yeah i've got a website mwtestconsultancy.co.uk where i blog on that as well um hoping to yeah sort of add a few bits in in the near future um yes. and then on two bit tester on twitter slash x uh or you can find me on linkedin mark winteringham and yeah, those kind of the places where I'm always open to sort of chat, talk AI or anything testing. Um, yeah, those kind of Thank places you. you can find me. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for coming by today. It was really nice talking to you. And I hope that everybody knows now more about like why you wrote a book, what are your current challenges, where do you see the future of testing heading towards? And yeah, thanks for coming by and have a great day. Yes, thanks for having me. Hey. I hope you enjoyed the interview today with Mark. I really enjoyed what he was sharing with us, the software testing community and his current contribution to it. So thanks again for coming by. Don't forget to share the interview with your network, to like it, to subscribe it, and also to take a look at the video description to find all about Mark's work and also find the links to his latest book. Thank you for coming by and see you soon.